Hey, the, the last course in the series for leadership ethics and law is the law course. And it's a, it is only a, it's a two credit course. It's given to first class midshipmen. And uh, coach, I appreciated your, your comment that he said it was the only course he remembered out of you know, leadership ethics and law as midshipmen. It was the only course I had as a midshipman, and it was taught by Captain Oliver North, who was not a lawyer. Uh, so it was interesting that, you know, who they picked to teach law to uh, us. So anyway, uh, John Todd is, is one of our uh, instructors, and the, the staffing that we have for the law courses is also a little bit different. We, they're all rotational officers. They're all JAG officers who come in from the Marine Corps and the Navy, and they, and they teach for hopefully three years, but we've had a couple of them called away on special duties to do special things, and we really appreciate that. Now, having said that, uh, coming in the fall, we will have our first distinguished military professor in leadership and law. So it's a DMP that will be longer term within LEL to help in the continuity of the course as we move along. But uh, you know, again, Coach, the, the importance for us in this course now, it is not just, here's the law, don't break it. It's here how you understand it, but you also use it as a leadership tool going forward. And so John is uh, uh, now going to, I mean, he's leading the he's course director for NL400 now, so John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to chat with you all today. I'm excited to give you a little insight into our course. Uh, one of my unspoken goals with my students uh, is to show them that um, Talking to a lawyer doesn't have to be painful and can occasionally be useful. Uh, so those are my goals for you today uh, as well. Um, Dr. Rao kind of gave you an overview of our staffing situation. It adds some benefits for us. Uh, it adds some new perspective, I think, uh, when you have new rotational officers checking in, particularly when they make up the majority of the staff. Um, but it does present some challenges for long-term stability. So we're excited to have a DMP joining us uh, in the fall. So where I'm going today, uh, I want to give you an overview of the course map similar to what our other course directors have done. Uh, we'll talk about one specific example, uh, probably where ethics ties most concretely into what we do in the course. Uh, and then we'll finish talking about some of the steps ahead for us uh, in incorporating ethics more directly into our curriculum. So what is this course about? Well, here's what the uh, Naval Academy course guide thinks that the course is about. This is usually where I start my students. I have them read this. It does a decent job, right? It tells you the broad picture of what this is, but it leaves a couple of big questions unanswered. Um, the first is, why is law a required course? Uh, I think Dr. Rao hit on one of it, uh, one of the reasons, and I think the reason that this course initially existed is, don't break the law. Uh, here's the law so you know not what not to do. Uh, we have tried to broaden that into, here's the law as a leadership tool, right? At the end of the day, our course serves as the capstone, the capstone is the wrong word, but the final course in their leadership education here at the Naval Academy. That's really different. The other service academies don't do that. Uh, law is a standalone course, it's still a required course, uh, but it is not part of the leadership curriculum. So let's take the first why question, why is law required? Don't violate the law, know how to use it as a leadership tool. But if we're gonna get to the next piece of that, you even have to go one question further. Should you be using the tool that you are using? And more importantly, why are you using the tool that you're using? As we go through the course map, you'll see what I mean by that. I'll walk you through some scenarios uh, on how that plays out in practice. The second question, why teach law as a function of leadership? Part of that is practical application. We really focus this course on you are about to be a division office or, or within the next couple of years, you're about to be a division officer. You're gonna be leading sailors and Marines. And one of your best tools for doing that is your legal options, right? And I don't just mean court martial. At the end of the day, they're not going to be super involved in that. We're talking about some of the lesser end of the spectrum. Things like non punitive measures, non-judicial punishment. Uh, some of you will know that as captain's mess. We want them to be comfortable with those tools uh, and know how they operate. So this is our uh, course map here. We break our course into three big functional areas, administrative law, military justice, and operational law. We close with that law of armed conflict decision-making scenario that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. At the very outset of the course, we try and frame this as a discussion about the Constitution. Everything that we do in the military, every authority we have can be traced back to that document. So you can think of that from things like the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Where do we get 
our authorities to search, to do inspections. You can think about that as uh, our protections against self-incrimination. When we ask our sailors or Marine soldier, or excuse me, questions about something that they may have done, we have to read them their rights. You can also think about that as authorities to use force. When can we apply, or excuse me, deploy our troops abroad? Who gets to make that decision and why? We really want them to have a fundamental foundation in the Constitution as the document that is going to be their guiding light throughout this course. So throughout each of these sections, we'll come back to that and talk about how this piece fits within that constitutional picture. Um, perhaps most important from that constitutional introduction course is the oath of office. Uh, and one of the things that Stockdale has done really well is their oath of office podcast. Um, the, the single session podcast is fabulous. We use that, the students like it a lot. It gives students a really good understanding of the significance of that oath uh, and, and how it can help guide them going forward. From that foundation, we move into investigations. So the Navy has a number of different types of investigations. We give them broad overviews of what those look like, uh, everything from a standard command investigation to a safety investigation um, to a litigation report uh, somebody wants to sue the United States government. To give you an example of how the ethics would play in that, we can look to a safety investigation. So one of the rules associated with safety investigations is that any information gathered during that process, right? So safety investigation happens when there's some sort of mishap. Somebody gets hurt or it's a close call, somebody could have been hurt, um, is that information gathered to interview somebody, uh, you can't use that information for any other purpose. The idea being you want people to be as honest with you as possible. So we present the students with a scenario, okay, so you're a safety investigator, you've gathered this statement. It turns out that the sailor, when talking to you about this mishap, has committed some sort of criminal wrongdoing. What is your ethical duty under those scenarios? Well, you kind of have things pointing in different directions, right? Safety investigation says you can't use that for any other purpose. But you also have an obligation under uh, general orders, standing orders for report misconduct. So what do you do? We bring about conflicts like that throughout the semester. And hopefully this gets to kind of your point earlier about, well, I always know what the right answer is. Sometimes that's not so easy. Sometimes the law can help you, but it doesn't always give you the final answer. From investigations, we move on into non-punitive measures. These are the very, very low level corrective measures that officers can take to uh, improve performance, address deficiencies, things like that. Um, so you can think things like extra military instruction, you can think things like uh, counseling. So we give them the rules, and this is gonna be true for everything that we talk about in this course. We give them the basic outline of what they are supposed to be doing under this heading, but we also ask them to think about application. Well, if you have a sailor or Marine that is doing X, Y, and Z, what tool are you gonna use and why? Not just about knowing the rules, but when they are appropriate to apply. And I should have said this at the outset, but uh, I am very clearly not an ethicist, and so I will not get the technical language of uh, ethics correct here. But what I wanna do as we kind of walk through this is point out where we highlight the moral dilemmas for the students when it comes to the application of law. For NJP as junior officers, their main role in the process, at least the formal process, is going to be advising the commander on their sailor. So they're going to give advice to the CO, uh, the uh, department head, depending on what type of proceeding we're talking about. Hey, what does the sailor bring to the table? Uh, what are they like in the workplace? And so we ask them to consider what are your audiences when you're doing that? Well, obviously one of them is going to be the CO giving a non-judicial punishment, but your audience is also going to include the unit. It's going to include that sailor that's standing in front of you, right? You need to think about how you are going to present yourself, right? It's not just about the rules of non judicial punishment, but what your role is within that proceeding. I don't know that administrative separations have a direct ethical tie-in, uh, at least as, as clear of one, so we'll kind of jump over that. Into military crimes and defenses, and this has actually become much more relevant in the last couple of years than I think we ever would have thought it would have been. Uh, one of the particular crimes we focus on is contemptuous political speech. So the idea being that as military officers, and this applies only to officers, there are certain limitations on your ability to make political speech, particularly when you tie it to your rank and your official position. Uh, the students are often kind of shocked by that. Uh, they, they understand somewhere in the back of their mind that there are certain things that they're not allowed to do, certain things that they're not allowed to say, but it's helpful to reiterate that while all of our constitutional rights apply as uniformed service members, they may apply slightly differently. 
And so we have that conversation. We talk about left and right boundaries. But this gets back to one of those questions. Just because the law says you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that it is the ethical or moral decision that you make. So just because you can walk right up the line on what you can say about a political leader uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that is a good ethical or even a good leadership tool, right? What message are you sending to those on you? From there, we talk about the, the core military justice ideas of searches, inspections, and self-determination. We talked about the Fourth Amendment a little bit already. Uh, it, for those of you that it's been a SIPs class, uh, it's been a little while since you've class, protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. In the military context, that has sort of a different meaning, uh, and the courts are willing to give us a lot of leeway, right? That's why we can do things like inspections, uh, health and comfort inspections, and bank and calls, things like that. But we ask the students to, to think about that. Just because you can get to, yes, I can go search the sailor's bunk or this room, make sure that you do that the right way. Make sure that you are following the process. Make sure not only to protect you legally, to protect your unit legally, to protect your commander legally, but what are your sailors going to think if you skirt the rules to get them, right, to get them? And sailors may default thinking that that's what you're going to do. So we ask them to think about those consequences in addition to the baseline rules. When it comes to the courts martial overview, we have them look at a lot of the things, the base procedures. You should know how courts martial work as uh, a graduate of the Naval Academy. But we also ask them to, to confront some of the more difficult issues that get handled in that through that process. We talk a little bit about uh, sexual assault, uh, the handling and prosecution of those cases. How do you support sailors and Marines that have been accused of that? How do you support sailors and Marines that have reported that? Um, what legal pitfalls do you need to avoid as a commander someday, or even as a junior officer? What can you say? What should you say? How do you handle that as a leader? Those are hard conversations, but they're, I think, useful to have. In the operational law context, um, we tie into some of the things that we've already talked about in NE203 uh, when it comes to just war theory. We talk about the law of armed conflict. The, the questions that we ask them to consider uh, at this stage, why bother having rules for war at all? Some of the great military theorists, some of the U.S. civil war theorists said war is hell and we should make it so. So why do we bother with these rules now. We ask them to really dive into that to, to apply the moral reasoning that they have learned at earlier points in their careers to think about the, the moral basis for rules on the operation of warfare. And even going one step beyond that, we have rules of engagement. Rules of engagement are at the very least the same as the law of armed conflict, but are often even tighter than the law of armed conflict, even more restrictive on what we can do. If the law says we can do it, why do we bind ourselves even more tightly than what the law allows? We force them to really grapple with that. Some of it is uh, political considerations, some of it's operational considerations, but some of it are moral considerations, right? Are we protecting our service members from moral injury by instituting the tighter rules of engagement? And all of that culminates in a law of armed conflict decision making scenario. And this is one of the ways that we really try to tie in with NE203. Uh, so that's going to be a little small to read, but this was one of the read aheads for this class. We give them a scenario where they've been given two, two clicking orders. You have a battalion commander that says, hey, once somebody is down, they're considered out of the fight, we're not attacking anybody else. You have a lower ranking officer, captain in this case, uh, Marine Corps captain, that intervenes and says, okay, unit, um, we've had lots of people die this way. They've been booby trapping, they're injured, they've been pretending to be out of the fight and shooting us, we're not gonna follow this order. So we kind of break the class into two separate questions. We ask them to consider the legal rules that we've talked about in this class. Right? What are the rules on conflicting orders? How do you follow them? How would you apply that to this scenario? But we also bring in one of the ethicists, or historically we have, we need to get back to doing this. We fell out of it a little bit during the COVID environment to say, well, what are the moral considerations here? To whom do you owe a duty in this scenario? Well, you owe a duty to your unit, right? And a lot of it shouldn't get spun around the axle on this. They say, well, they're blowing up our guys. They are not following the laws of war. I owe a duty to protect the men in my unit from this action. But who else do you owe a duty to here? Well, you owe a duty to your commander. You owe a duty to your country. You owe a duty to the oath that you swore. And so we, we walk through some of the implications of that, but we also ask them to, to practically apply it. How are you going to do this? Okay, great. So you tell me that you think that you are going to say, 
Uh, Captain Marvin, that's a law of war violation. I'm not going to follow that order. Okay, how do you have that conversation? That's easy to say in the classroom. Um, or, I think the harder question is, you don't have time to talk to Captain Marvin. Your order is now to go out and do. You're going to talk to your unit. So even the folks that we get to uh, get to the correct legal and moral answer, I'm not going to follow that intervening order. Okay, great. Show me how you're going to do it. This ends up being a really good class. The students like this a lot. It forces them to confront some of those difficult legal and moral considerations and kind of bring together a lot of the leadership lessons that they've learned over the course of the course. Um, there are some things we need to do to get better about incorporating ethics into our law course, though. If, if I could add on that, because uh, as teaching the, the course from the ethics point of view, we are brought in to help facilitate this conversation and say, now make sure you really understand the decision that you've been asked to do. And then they say, okay, this is what I would do. And this is, again, one of these classes that, this is a, it's a term called double tap, which you may or may not have heard, but, but, but double tap is a term that was used that if you see someone wounded, you, you shoot them again in the head real quick, just to make sure they're dead. Um, and uh, so you have this conversation and, and some say yes and some say no. And then, and the interesting part of that our JAG folks do is, is okay, now, now you're going to be court martial. Let me tell you how I'm going to defend you. Let me tell you if I'm going to defend you. Let me tell you if I'm the prosecutor, what I'm going to do. And it, it again, it puts this other spin on it that I've gone through this process. I have been able to make this decision. This is what I think that's going to be right. And then you have the JAGs come in and say, okay, is what you thought was right going to match up with the, what the law says is right? And then it's this big jaw drop. You go, man. I thought you're here to protect me. No, well, I'm here to prosecute you. That's an interesting uh, part of the conversation, which which brings the legal part of the expertise from our JAG officers into the classroom that really helps bring some real um, metal to this course. Well, and that there are consequences no matter what you choose. Even if you choose to disobey the order of the person above you, unless that was a clearly unlawful order, and we, we spin the scenario sometimes to make it a less obvious answer, you could be held responsible for not following a lawful order. Are you ready to accept the consequences for that? Do you understand what that means? And so I think that really clarifies, I think a lot of students come into this class sort of like your, your student in chemistry thinking, well, it's black and white, right? Either I can do it or I can't do it. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Often it's a little more gray, excuse me, a little more gray than that. Um, and even when it's not, just because you can do something doesn't mean that that is the moral or ethical decision. So the things that we need to do better uh, at Dental 400, uh, I sent you the topic level learning objectives that kind of outline what we try to accomplish at each step of the course. You'll notice that we don't talk about ethics a lot at the topic level learning objectives. I think we can do a better job of making that explicit. A lot of us bring it into the classroom just because we know that's where we fit in this department, but we need to make that a little more obvious for our rotational officers to come in. We need to get the emphasis back in the classroom uh, for our low act decision making scenario. It makes for a better conversation. It to get it better. Uh, we also need to refresh the law act scenario. So the scenario that we gave you is very um, CENTCOM driven, very street to street driven. And as we all know, we are out of Afghanistan here in the next three months. Um, and so we are in the process of designing some new ones. One of the ones we're considering is actually a cyber scenario. Um, and so it, I may reach out to you, man, at some point and talk to you about that uh, to, to give them some, some new spin and less marine centric spin uh, on these issues. Um, and I will plug Stockdale content again. Uh, I, I promise Dr. McCree didn't pay me for this beforehand. But their Oath of Office podcast is fabulous. Their ethics simulations are great as well. That's something that I want to incorporate into our, our classroom a little bit more as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Have you have you been asked, Ms. Gary, as the JAG officers to come and participate in any of the other classes or any other department? Not within the department, no. So we do, the political science department does bring us in uh, to talk to their pleads uh, when they do their civil rights courses. Okay. Um, and we occasionally will teach an elective over there as well. But no, we, no, we haven't. And, and I asked it just to, uh, we make that often. If, if there's, you know, things that you want to do, we have uh, we learned a lot of lessons during uh, 
COVID, especially in some of the lockdown, about making our people available to the brigade in general and to support some sporting teams uh, specific. And so um, we certainly want to make our staff faculty available for, for folks to, to come and, and, and help with some of those things. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you dialed into um, Late Night with Loose, but that was a really great opportunity for um, not just our staff, but to bring in other people external to the Naval Academy to come just talk about issues that are on people's minds today. That's probably one of the things since I've been back that was the most positive. To me. So many <clears throat> mids talked to me about it unsolicited and said how great it was. But you don't hear mids saying things are really good. So that was a great thing on that brilliant idea. Do you want to share what that was? Because I don't know that everyone knows. Okay, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. When um, I forget the exact time frame, but I guess it was when the uh, brigade got put into a three week. It was March, I think. Hard lockdown. Um, we started talking about podcasts. We started talking about some of these things, and so for an extended period of time, from six in the evening till one o'clock in the morning each hour, there was a different person who was brought in to talk about something. And I say something, um, many of the, many of us, because some of us were part of that, came in with a topic that we wanted to talk about. Others was just a wide open, let's have a conversation. And so we were, oh, it was offered to a very, oh, for the brigade. If you want to dial in and listen, if you want to dial in and contribute, just dial in. And um, we, had, we had some folks like Marcus Luttrell, who you may know is, uh, was the lone survivor, um, and you know, for that for that night, we had a, a thousand midshipmen dialing just to, to listen to him for an hour to talk about his experience. And we had a lot of our staff, and again, we had like external people coming in, just having these conversations. Um, for a while, we kind of wondered because it, you know, it was from we had people dialing in from six o'clock at night to one o'clock in the morning, and during the school week, that's probably not the best thing for everybody to do. But uh, there there was a group that really, you know. Hung that on to this, and we're dialing every night and just listening in and um, participating the way they could. It gave us an opportunity on staff to share, and it gave them an opportunity to share. We, we regularly would you know, take questions from them, the midshipmen, and kind of generate another uh, podcast to talk about at a later date. So it was something that went on for, for quite a while. Uh, once they got out of the three week um, hard lockdown, it became more of a Thursday night, Friday night. Thing and so we weren't stealing as much of the study time. That's what that was, and it was. And I, and I, actually, I'll say it wasn't just LEL. I mean, we had folks from some of the other departments come in and talk about things also. Well, I think what what Nick liked about it was it was focused on them, and it was actually somebody in the in a safe space, the leadership and administration, who who wanted to do something for them. That's how they view it. Hey, they actually do care about us. They're actually trying to help us. They actually, we're not the villains here. They, that's how it was taken. So it, it's, it's the perfect thing and kind of the perfect time. John, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Uh, Jeff, I think that kind of wraps up the, you know, our, our curriculum within leadership ethics and law. Yeah, thanks very much, Professor Rao and uh, Lieutenant Tan. I'd appreciate that. Well, our, uh, our concluding uh, workshop presentation today on this initial day of the uh, ethics across the curriculum and, and yard workshop is a discussion of uh, ethics requirements in ABET, uh, ACS, and the uh, middle states for uh, higher education. Uh, so we'll turn this over now to um, Provost Catherine Cermak and to uh, Professor uh, Allison Webster Giddings. Please. I just come back in a Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take a seat. Why not, right? Um, okay, so thanks everyone for your time. Um, Catherine and I are, are going to talk to you and present to you some thoughts about um, how do ethics relate to our disciplines as professionals within academics. 
And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about accreditation at the Naval Academy and how that evolves. And then I've pulled together uh, a set of standards that relate to your specific disciplines as best as I could. So um, apologies now if I don't thoroughly cover that. There is a document that's linked for you with some additional resources for you that you might find useful for you in your course of study and work this week. Um, and so we'll take a look at that. Uh, I do want to just give a quick shout out to PEO IWS, which is the Program Executive Officer for Integrated Warfare Systems. And you might ask, how do they relate to all this? They pay for my position. So as a warfighter, they've asked me to come in and take a look at it, not only relate our engineering curriculum to what's going on in the fleet, but also look across the, the, um, the yard to do that. And so I they're very concerned about ethics and the use of ethics inside of both the use and the design of weapon systems. Um, so that's thanks to them for making this happen. Um, so what are some elements of profession, of a profession? There's some good arguments to be made about some different types of elements, whether they're three, whether they're 10, but here's some critical ones that I've pulled out. One is that there's a defined body of knowledge uh, and there's a required course of study. So we're inviting our undergraduate students to participate or become members of a profession of these academic disciplines that we're working within. And it's not just the knowledge, but there's also this system of support for them. So we've defined what the profession is, and then there are practices within the profession and if you violate those practices, there are consequences. Or if you support those practices, there are positive consequences. And so therefore, that's this code of positive and negative behavior. And many of the professions will have a list of a code of ethics. And you can look up what that code of ethics is. And there are some similarities and differences. And I'll try to highlight some of those things. But lastly, is um, this relationship that they have among the professionals within uh, that discipline. And so I've brought up this term a sense of belonging because as academics, we know that when our students feel a sense of belonging either to the institution, they perform better or to the discipline, they perform better. So that they create this identity of not only I am a midshipman, I am desiring to become a Naval or Marine Corps officer, but I am also an engineer. I'm also a historian, and this is what I'm learning to study. And this is what keeps them involved inside of that profession. So um, what are we doing with ethics inside of teaching these disciplines in this profession? Um, historically, we used to te teach it in very stoke-like organizations, which um, and, and that has changed. So just the same language that you're hearing now, uh, that we're trying to infuse it across the curriculum with the Naval Academy, we see this inside of our own discipline. And that teaching the ethics has really spread beyond just some of these core humanities disciplines, but inside of all of the disciplines. Um, so where do the sources uh, come from? Really, I've focused on two things. One is the accrediting institutions. And at the Naval Academy, that's um, Middle States. Um, so MISH, the American Chemical Society, and AVET for engineers. And these are the organizations that accredit us. So this makes our education of value. So we have to look at the standards and what ethics, um, how that is defined within that accreditation. And then also within uh, professional societies. So what I've done is I've kind of, sort of broken this down into um, the different disciplines, and I've pulled out some quotes from both of the accrediting institution and from the societies. So I'll start here with humanities, and um, I pulled from the Language Association and ACLS. Um, and I thought that the highlighted areas are, are of interest to us. And so first off, humanities is a really broad topic. And so um, ACLS does say that there are many societies that are involved. 
and that they look at all of those societies bring in thoughts of ethics um, and that there is a sense of freedom to operate within that but that freedom carries responsibilities and what are some of those responsibilities and so within communities i'm focusing on a sense of how do you develop cogent arguments and this might not be particularly obvious that that's an that there are ethical implications of that, but it's the sense of um, understanding what the argument is, how do you develop that, and your responsibility to listen to others. And so that's that fairness and hearing and reading the arguments that make us a better professional. That there is a community, and that community is actively engaging in improving that discipline. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we have to honor both the integrity um, and the historical record. So that's looking back, but as well as looking forward and what are the responsibilities that we have to the future um, who might be affected by the discipline that we're creating. And then finally, this idea of um, freely participating. So that's encouraging voices to be heard within the discussion, teamwork. So how do we engage in teamwork um, so that we can help our undergraduates understand that? So next then, I, I explored um, the library and the disciplines uh, associated there. And I, here I pulled both under um, Middle States and the American Library Association. And this is really interesting because here um, ALA is talking about how do you influence um, information? And so information that's in the past, who gets engaged in that discussion in the present, and in the future, who might be using the information? So part of ethics is defending the innocent, and who might be the innocent? Well, those might be the people who are not in the current conversation, and who might be affected in the future. So. Um, influencing or controlling the selection, organization, preservation of that information. Um, understanding that there is a special obligation of that free flow. And here I thought was really interesting is future generation. And um, so it's preserving why, because we're going to use it in the future. If we only preserve one side of the information, then we're creating bias on um, resources. Um, and then how do we access that information? So how do you access the information here at the Naval Academy? So we have an obligation to educate our plebes on what information is available. And then as they become more senior, how might they access that information? And um, how might they use that information? How is it preserved? Is it digitally? Is it in print? Um, what's the need? What's the speed of access? These are all great questions to consider. Um, and then intellectual property rights. So someone else has created the information. How do we or give credit to that? How do we use that appropriately? I would encourage if at any point you have questions to ask about these. So then we move um, more uh, sort of away from the humanities into sciences and engineering. So ACS uh, was a, is a prominent um, uh, discipline and professional society. Um, they're very explicit that ethics should be an intentional part of the instruction. Uh, and then it's specifically, there's a section within your code that talks about how do we teach chemistry. Um, and that um, they should be specifically trained in the responsible treatment of data which makes a lot of sense. We spend a lot of time gathering the data and then analyzing the data. Um, and then this element of thinking about the results and how does this diverse group of students or diverse group of peers uh, relate to that, to, to those data. Um, further that, the curriculum should really expose the students to societal and global issues. Wow, so that's a big topic and how do we wrap our heads around 
of that within the limited amount of time that we had to teach these students chemistry. So the practice is like not only that, but the literature. Um, and then it the the discipline um, challenges the faculty to exemplify the conduct and the models that we're asking them to do. And then um, finally to uh, recognize that it's it's a complex problem and that there are ethical components to the complexity of the problem. So we're asked to think about what are those ethical components to this. I was saying, yeah. with, you said with the accreditation and with this, is are these the instruments or are these the questions that are being used to assess chemistry at the Naval Academy? So ACS is, so both middle states as an institution yeah. is accrediting, um, and ACS accredits the chemistry major. So this is, these are quotes that are pulled out of the code of ethics within ACS. And so, you know, it, typically what happens within accreditation is that um, we are asked to set standards and then we are measured as to how well we right. achieve those standards. Mm -hmm. So in setting the standards and the method by which we're applying them, these are sort of some of the ideas that you should be thinking about. Yeah. Did I get that right, Catherine? Yeah, I'll look at Shirley. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. Having been involved in the assessment and the department for a while, uh, this I wouldn't say we, we look at these statements. I think we're still early in our journey in the ethics instruction and not quite at the part where we're assessing how well the students are doing it, but hopefully Jenny and I have talked about this. If you have sort of this map of where we're hitting each of these, you know, points in the curriculum, and we do it in a deliberate way that is done by all the instructors, no matter you know, we rotate it out teaching our courses, so we buy in from everyone. You know, hopefully by by that time when we set it up, then there could be there could be a more assessment like experience. Towards the end of the major, where we give them a scenario to say, we'll break this down based upon the, the chemist, chemistry professional code of ethics. What are those considerations? Okay. And, and just before shutdown in March 2020, we had a three panel review as part of our five year ACS site um, visit prior to re accreditation. And we provided information about what we had done in our nascent ethics um, endeavors and they were pleased but it was not a requirement at that point so these are i think they're more aspirational mm -hmm. for us but this is a code of professional behavior for practicing chemists mm -hmm. and that was sort of the origin for the Michigan scenario mm -hmm. There was a scenario that was created by one of the chemistry faculty mm -hmm. collecting the information about the other ethical data collection, thinking about that in terms of sectoral cooperation, sectoral cooperation, where do you collect your data? Um, are you missing you know, individuals who are impoverished because they're not really your population center in? How do you use that information? So it's kind of bringing in a lot of these different aspects. But that's interesting to me. That's why Flint, Michigan is still in the news, right? Yeah. It's not black and white. Yeah. <laughs> um, so ABAT uh, accredits engineering and then computing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and computing, thanks. And so I, then I also pulled, I looked at IEEE, um, hopefully to, to help, um, you know, computing and um, electrical engineering and, and understanding some of these things. Um, so as an engineer within ABAT, we're thinking about also not only using the data properly, but also um, enhancing human wealth, and that's really aspirational. So um, thinking about that is the, why do we do engineering? What is the process and what are we hoping to achieve? We're trying to make the world a better place. Um, 
And then how do we do that? Um, I, I thought that this word of fidelity is really important. So we're being honest and impartial, um, but we're servicing with fidelity. So who are we servicing? Who to whom are we loyal? And um, then that sort of next answer is um, the welfare of the public. So we're serving the public. And so when our students are designing, they're not just designing for themselves and for who's paying for it, but they have to understand the constraints and the impact of um, people who might be affected by it. They might be um, unknown users, but they might also be individuals who perhaps wanted to use the resources that we're going to be used in our engineering design. So um, thinking about that. And then also performing those services only in the areas of their competence. So thinking about their, their obligations to learn the material so that we do become competent. And then um, what's the balance between understanding what their competence is and sort of seeking to learn um, more in the course of solving their problems. Um, then looking at IEEE, so thinking about, again, the societal implications of conventional and emerging technologies. And then I thought this was interesting, including intelligent systems. So what are, I mean, this is, what are the emerging technologies out there? What are intelligent systems? How do they relate to us in the present day? And then what's the impact on the future? How, how will that affect our society? Um, Seeking to accept and offer honest criticism. Again, really important. Uh, I'll use my Knowles uh, expeditionary behavior. Seeking and receiving feedback. So how do you become a good team member and provide that and work together to do so? And then supporting your colleagues and coworkers in following this code of ethics, uh, which gets into our discussion of love, right? So it's not just a matter of I have to do a good job, but I have to support my um, my coworkers and my teammates in doing a good job. So I thought these were some important elements. Well, that's really there. interesting that that piece of it mm -hmm. is this is that the only document that had that sort of collaborative um, like it really spelled out that that was an important piece of it. Um, all, all of the societies have some element of teamwork of community. Mm -hmm. um, but within IEEE, I thought this was really important that they, they spelled out that it's supporting. So it's not just um, identifying the deviant behavior, but right, it's right. supporting the colleagues in following the growth the piece of it. Growth piece of it. Yeah. So when you, um, when you look at the learning outcomes that ADA requires for its programs, and not the code of ethics, but the requirements within the curriculum, there's a change. So teamwork sometimes um, is an easy word just for the mates to use because that means, oh, I'm in a group and therefore I'm part of a team. So but pulling back on the leadership curriculum and thinking about what that means to be a member of the team and then in using the, the ethical implications and the decisions of the process. Um, um, then I have to say I was a little challenged by the by the <laughs> athletics discipline, uh, but to our coaches, um, I took a look at both middle states and then NCAA. And middle states is really interesting because they have their own language, uh, which is in this first bullet, and I'll come back to that. But there's also Title IX and the Ninth Commission. Um, and so Title IX, I, I found, was very interesting because there is a clause within Title IX that says that institutions, uh, I'll sort of paraphrase, that are trained military members do not need to um, follow Title IX. And so I sent a quick note over to NAAA and say, um, does this apply, does it not? But interestingly, our strategic plan um, calls out elements of Title IX. So, whether or not we explicitly need to follow it, we are certainly implicitly following it, and then within our strategic plan. 
And then the Knight Commission, for those who might not be familiar with it, is a commission that is an independent party. Um, it has been existing for a fairly long time, but it's looking at how do we improve the practice of intercollegiate athletes. Um, and so they met with some box periodically. And uh, currently they're looking at uh, a fairly significant topic that they're looking at is the payment of uh, unprofessional athletes. So, uh, what is what is this take a look at middle states? Um, so here um, they really put a burden on the coaches and the athletic administrators uh, who are under significance to um, define what sportsmanship is and what ethical behavior is, um, and then. And CAA also focuses on sportsmanship and ethical behavior. And um, sportsmanship is is distinguished from gamesmanship, where gamesmanship might be a uh, winning, and sportsmanship is following a set of behaviors uh, that have been defined by the institution. Uh, and so that then requires us to say, what do we see as sportsmanship? Um, I don't, well, I'll say then ethical con conduct is um, saying that each person must follow the letter and spirit of the rule. So not simply our athletes, uh, but also our coaches, and then also the audience that's participating. That's a big challenge. Um, and so, that, and a very far reach to think about within um, this profession. Um, and then again, they're, they're talking about sportsmanship as defined by the institution. Title IX um, has a couple of elements that I thought were interesting. One is trying to provide broad opportunities for as many students as possible. And those broad opportunities are sort of the numbers of opportunities and then um, as many as possible. So thinking about the limited resources that we have um, and the number of students, and then how do you define what those groups of students are, and then how do you make them available, and what are those opportunities? Um, and then again, the Knight Commission comes right back to all the administrative responsibility. I thought this was interesting in that it was that all program, the responsibility for these programs rests with the chief executive of the institution and the governing board. And so, it's really important for us to be modeling that behavior. Um, so those, I, I think, are the sort of the major groupings of disciplines that we've been talking about um, this week. And um, I hope that it's helpful. Again, you might want to refer to the, the additional document that's there for you with some links. And um, throughout the week, maybe be thinking about these two questions. So are there professional standards or disciplinary trends um, that are ongoing right now and that are important that the students in Michigan or maybe faculty are thinking about and are engaging in? And how might they be influencing your workshop outcomes? Um, and if so, how might that be practicing, influencing your practice this week? So, would like to end with thoughtful questions. And um, I, I, if you have any comments or thoughts that you'd like to raise, or share, or ask uh, Catherine or myself, we, we're here for you. I think we have a couple more. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please, Ken, thank you. I'll just offer an observation. I think you could almost turn the running outcome upside down here, uh, but in a good way. I think what you just exposed in here, we talk about it, just put it as ethics across the curriculum, then it's not that it's across the yard. But what I see here opportunity is with what we just exposed in each one of the uh, disciplines, academic disciplines, and sports is, I mean, is there opportunity to incorporate some of these vignettes, particularly in the end two or three? So we're asking, we're asking, right, for uh, how do we integrate ethics across the different, uh, you know, yard, but we probably should be thinking, we should consider with the opportunity of, okay, can we help also by 
you know, learn from your particular challenges and experiences and incorporate those case studies in any two or three, which by the way are probably case studies that are mentioned will have an opportunity to even further habituate while they're here at the Naval Academy. So I just offer that as a lot. Uh, Kevin, thanks for bringing that up, and and uh, an invite to all of our participants here, both instructors and and uh, individuals from across the yard. Uh, we're looking for case studies in uh, in our leadership sequences. So if you can, uh, if you can think of these, uh, pull one of our instructors aside this week, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about a write up, and which course uh, it might be uh, it might be appropriate for. Yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Comments or questions for. Uh, Allison or uh, Catherine Sermon. Yeah. Please. I thought it was really interesting you pulled out the word game, so these four teach that one of the last classes that I took uh, before I left Duke was a class on adversarial ethics. And it kind of falls into that domain of like sports. And how do we understand ethics in our relationships or moral behavior when we're put in systems that are intentionally designed to compete? And the sports offers huge lessons to all of us as it's about how those rules are set, who set the rules, how the rules are enforced by referees, and all the different dynamics that go into deciding what's a ball fake versus what's a flop or what's something like that. You can hear it like a few different times. Yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting as I sort of did my own course of study at the last month or so to really understand that. And, and I was thankful that the athletic profession um, had defined it. Um, I, I'll just, if, if we have a minute, so at thinking about these elements of a profession, I was thinking about the ethics, the four elements uh, that were involved in them, the, the roadmap, and this sort of answers some of those questions. I'm just going to go back to my notes here. Um, there are moral obligations, I think, are really part of this defining the body of knowledge. Right? And then um, uh, thinking about the right thing to do, this to me is a part of their course of study as a profession within that discipline. You're learning what those right things to do are. And then the virtues to cultivate are very parallel to me in establishing this, um, these systems to support the professional ethics uh, and the consequences. And then um, the fight and win honorably to me is this last element of the, um, developing a sense of belonging and a sense of community. So um, I, I will do a little bit more of this. This is my action item is to think about our elements of the ethical the ethics curriculum and within the elements of profession. Lots of elements. I could end on the very last part. The, uh, we spent a lot of effort recently on the moral injury part. Because when you say, you know, you, you fight to win in an ethical way, there is a very moral component to that that affects the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, because to to win by cheating leaves you one way. To win or to lose by you know, you know following the rules leaves you in in, in another respect. Yeah. So it's just important to just consider the, the personal impact, lasting personal impact, or whether you follow the rules or not. So, I, so this is another slide that I love right here, and it brought to me uh, very recently, two weeks ago, I took a group of midshipmen down to South Cop, um, and then one of the deputy commanders, Martin, shared with them about the difference between profession and career, and, and, and to me, what he highlighted the most was self-policing mm -hmm. at the end of the day, professional self-policing, gets back to, we talk about here about the tendency of consequences, but going back to accountability. Okay. Professionals self police themselves, yeah. improve themselves. Yeah. You know, and a measure of respect and dignity towards your own profession. Um, so that's all I want to share that. Army Thank West Home Graduate. Still early. Mm -hmm. And that brings up an excellent point. So, Hot Diamond and Alice and I were talking at the beginning uh, in a small group, and one of the issues that, that was brought up is, is the lack of self-policing certain situations. Um, sort of the, speaking from the chemistry perspective, like developing a sense of belonging hasn't always been extended to everyone who's sort of doing sports. I 
and, and other you know behaviors that we would acknowledge are wrong, sexual harassment has there's not been clean by institution or by the community. So this question of you have these elements of a profession, I don't think anyone would say, yeah, we don't agree with that code that of ethics that, that you're putting out there, but then we need it. You actually put yourself on the line and say something or intervene. Okay, I'm going to stop recording here for the first uh, session of the ethics across the curriculum in the yard. And